Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, amazing OCD community. I am one of your IOCDF lead advocates, Katie O'Dunn, and I am really excited to be here again for another OCD mailbag to answer a lot of your questions that you might have submitted before or during live streams that we haven't gotten to quite yet. Um, I am often talking about all things faith and OCD as I am an ordained minister and an interfaith chaplain who has OCD, who navigates OCD, and who spends a lot of my time helping others navigate OCD and navigate faith, but I'm going to be answering a whole host of questions today um, from a lived experience perspective and advocacy perspective, but also addressing some things related to faith and OCD. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and dive in. The first question we have, what gaps do you still see in the world of OCD and mental health advocacy? This is a really great question that um, I probably should have thought through a little bit before this because I feel like there are so many. Um, you know, I, I'm so proud to be an advocate with the IOCDF. And I remember in the height of my struggles, really watching other folks advocate and feeling like that would never be me, that I would never be in a place to do that, or that my OCD was different, or that I would never get better. And um, it's such an honor and, and a gift to get to do that. Um, and at the same time, I know that there is still so much work to do to let folks know that OCD isn't an adjective, that it isn't a cute quirk, right? Um, and there's also work around making sure that everyone, everyone, everyone has access to evidence-based treatments like exposure and response prevention. I know that because of issues of insurance and um, economic struggles, as well as the expense of treatment, um, it can be really, really hard for folks to access the treatment, even when you do um, finally maybe get a diagnosis or, or know what effective treatment might look like. And I think these are areas in, in advocacy that are challenging, but that we need to continue to have conversations about to make sure not only that everybody knows what OCD is and how it's treated, but that everyone has access to that um, from a financial standpoint, but also hopefully in a place free of stigma where they can go back into their communities and feel loved and supported. Okay, next question. How should family members react to loved ones with OCD when their behaviors are OCD driven? Yeah, so this, this is a really great question. And for the person who has OCD, it can be so, so tempting to ask family members for reassurance or to ask family members to offer some level of support or um, to have them say, oh, no, you're actually safe in this moment. And family members, if you are getting these questions, please know that reassurance or any form of accommodation is not helpful for your loved one with OCD. Now, one of the things that can be really tough, and I've been there as an OCD sufferer, is sufferers sometimes get really upset when you don't answer those questions. I know, um, even in recovery, there are days that I get frustrated with family, that I get frustrated at my fiance, Ethan, um, another one of our IOCDF advocates, where it's like, ah, oh, can't you just answer this question for me? And he always responds really well, and I hope I respond um, equally as well for him, and he always tells me that he's not talking to my OCD right now. Um, and that's always really helpful for me to hear. I think that even if someone gets upset that you're not answering their questions or that you're not offering reassurance or any form of accommodation, I think you can say, you know what? I know this is really hard for you. And I wanna let you know that I'm here, that I love you, that I'm offering you so much compassion and that I can't imagine how challenging this must be. And at the same time, I love you so much that I'm not going to answer questions that are going to feed your OCD right now. I'm not going to talk to your OCD, but I will sit here with you in the discomfort so that you're not alone in that. Okay, next question. What is the worst piece of OCD advice you have ever received? Um, yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, there are many individuals who think they treat OCD that don't. That's why we have our awesome IOCDF directory to make sure that you're able to find someone who is knowledgeable and trained in exposure and response prevention. Um, but probably the worst advice that 
I heard in my journey and advice that I continue to hear, unfortunately, from folks who might not have the right training, um, is that we should be pushing away our thoughts, that we should be thought stopping. Ideas around like, oh, just imagine a big stop sign in your mind or snap a rubber band, any, any of those things. Um, and it's really, it's really something that's not helpful. It's actually doing the opposite. By trying to shove that thought away, it's actually coming back 10,000 times stronger. Um, and it's just all around not good advice when exposure and response prevention is very much about the opposite. It's inviting that thought in for tea and saying, you know what, we're going to let this be here and we're going to continue on with our day. We're not going to engage with it, but it can sit in the back seat of the car and it can come along for the ride. And that's actually how it gets a lot quieter, not by shoving it away. Um, so I think that's heard a lot of bad advice, but that's probably the consistent piece that um, that I continue to hear that I want folks to know. It is not about pushing your thoughts away. It is about allowing them to be there while not engaging with them and also not engaging in compulsions or in rituals. Okay, so this one says, OCD latches onto my values, exercise, healthy eating, um, and it contorts them. Sometimes the compulsion feels so right and in line with my values that it's almost impossible to tell the difference between what I want and what my disorder wants. At these times, I find my motivation in sharing my accomplishments with my parents as I don't necessarily believe I'm doing the right thing. Is that counterintuitive to getting better even if I'm not actually motivated for my own sake? I am still sitting with discomfort. However, I can also see how sharing what I've done could possibly be a form of reassurance. Um, wow, I know there's a lot of layers here. And thank you so much for your, your willingness to, to ask this. Um, I would actually recommend you check out one of the recent town halls that we did earlier this year. Um, I moderated it and we had some awesome clinicians on there. And we were talking about determining OCD or de sorry, determining your values when when OCD latches onto your values or makes you question your values. Um, and that can be really common because that's really the nature of OCD, right? It, it latches on to everything significant to us, and yet it's egodystonic. So it distorts it. It makes you question it. So for instance, um, if there is a parent who the most important thing to them is their child, well, OCD might latch onto that and it might make them feel like they aren't equipped to be a parent. It makes them even question that value. And that's really tough when you're trying to figure out, well, what is in line with my values, right? So <laughs> One of the interesting things that I've heard and one of the things that's helpful in determining those values is sometimes even looking at what is the thing that OCD is latching onto and acknowledging that if OCD is latching onto something or if it's distorting something, it's probably because it's something that's really important to you. And I would encourage you as you go through this journey of figuring out those things that are important to you and that do bring you joy, because by the way, you do deserve a beautiful life filled with joy. Um, you deserve all sorts of compassion from those around you, but also from yourself, okay? Um, I, I think it's it's tricky. Um, I think that it's normal to want to share accomplishments with those we love. I know I do that, right? And I definitely think doing that over and over again to maybe prove to yourself that you're good enough could become compulsive. I would encourage you to talk to maybe your clinician about that. But um, without it being a form of reassurance seeking, I also think it's normal to want to share the things that are meaningful to you with those around you. So I think, unfortunately, there's a little gray area there. Um, and not being motivated for your own sake, I think is sometimes a part of the journey. I, I spent a long time in my own journey thinking, I want to get better for everybody else. I want to get better for my family. I want to get better for my students. And um took me a long time to hit the point where I actually felt like I deserved to get better for me. Um, and like, I deserve to live this beautiful life. And I, I think I would even encourage you with this, not to be hard on yourself, because I think this is a journey too, and it's great to want to get better for those around you. But I think some self-compassion practices um, would be really wonderful. I know there's a ton of great self-compassion resources out there. Um, and I know even one of our IOCDF advocates, Kim Quinlan, um, her, her book on self-compassion is, is great. But really thinking about how can you offer yourself that same love and compassion that you offer others and even acting as if, even if you don't feel it in that moment. I know it seems silly, 
but maybe even giving yourself permission when you accomplish something to say, woohoo, I am super excited. I'm really proud of myself, even if it doesn't feel true in that moment. And giving yourself permission to get excited for you, I think can be a step in that journey. Okay. Is it possible to be OCD completely or is it a constant struggle? Does it try to find its way back from time to time? Yeah, this is such a great question. And um, this is a topic I love to talk about. It's a, actually a topic that I'm going to be talking about with Kim Quinlan and Shala Nicely and with my fiance, Ethan Smith, at the upcoming virtual conference. This idea that OCD is very much something that I believe I'll navigate for the rest of my life. But that doesn't mean there's not hope. It, it's actually very much the opposite. Um, I, I think to me, being in recovery and living this big, beautiful life with OCD is really is really what we strive for and recognizing that, yeah, there might be bumps along the road. I actually had a day yesterday that was really, really tough. But like Ethan always says, more good days than bad. Um, got to lean into um, all of the discomfort and sit with all of the uncertainty, stick with all of the ick and try again today. And um, I, I think it's really the attitude of acknowledging that, yeah, OCD might be a part of my journey. I might approach things through a particular lens because of OCD, because of this doubting disorder. And at the same time, it's by recognizing that I have OCD that I can continue to stay in maintenance and management and recovery. Um, John Hirschfield wrote an awesome article a while back on how the quote unquote cure to OCD is knowing that there is no quote unquote cure for OCD. And I, I really love that. And there's some element really of hope in that of, yeah, so what? I'm going to navigate this throughout the rest of my life, but not in a way that it's going to steal joy or steal aspects out of my life or steal anything that I want to do. And I really believe we can all be at that point where it doesn't have to be a constant struggle. It's actually by acknowledging that, yeah, OCD is there and there are going to be some stuck points that you can live a life that isn't a daily struggle, that you can live this life that you were created to live, not by shoving OCD away, by, but by saying, you know what, I can live with OCD. I've got this. I can use my skills and my tools from ERP and from ACT, and I can let it come along for the ride. I can let it sit in the backseat of the car. It is not going to be driving anymore. I'm going to drive, um, but it can be there, and I can still have this big, awesome, beautiful life, even if there are some stuck points and stuck days like I had yesterday, today is one of the most beautiful days I've had in a long time. And those two things can both go together. Um, okay. I was diagnosed with harm OCD at an early age and have seen a lot of clinical and social media talk around present and, fo um, and future focused harm OCD, um, but not a ton from providers or sufferers sharing their experience with actually being convinced they have killed people, mainly dealing with rumination as a compulsion. I suspect part of the reason may be um, that this would be one of the scariest and most stigmatizing things to address in public, but it's often felt like I'm the only one, which then in itself, unfortunately, reinforces my rumination. Do you have any experience in treating this type of harm OCD and is it common? Yeah, so um, thank you for asking this. And, and this is one that really speaks to my heart because this was a core theme for me. Um, my themes, I'm an ordained minister. I love people. I love animals. I love family. And OCD latches onto the things that are important to us. So for me, it very much latched onto this aspect of being a dangerous, harmful person. Um, and to your point, some of my biggest themes actually related to things from the past of really worrying, what if I committed a violent crime and blocked it out or forgot? Or what if I'm actually remembering it by trying to think about it, but pushing it away? All sorts of things. To the point that even as a minister, um, I got to a point where I was officiating funerals and officiating services and helping folks navigate grief and trauma around incidents um, and then at the same time or incidents and at the same time wondering, well, what if what if this is actually my fault? What if I just somehow blocked things out and I'm responsible for all of this in all of these different ways? It's really tough. And I think as you probably know in asking this, this question, um, the more you ruminate, the more you try to figure it out, the more you 
try to replay things in your mind or figure out, well, is this real? Is this not? What is that? It becomes more cemented. It's kind of this idea of you try to think of this thing that you know isn't true to make sure it's not true. And then all of a sudden you can see it in your head and you're like, wait, is that true? Um, that's a lot of times what happens with false memories, which aren't really false memories. It's it's actually just OCD about the past. It's a question about the past that isn't something that actually took place, but just like the future, it's something we wonder. And the more energy we put on it, um, the more it becomes really cemented in our brain. Um, I was really stuck on some really specific harm, false memory content for a big part of my journey. It actually comprised um, a pretty major relapse for me. Um, the same relapse actually that got me into advocacy. Um, I had spent most of my life really quiet about my story, really ashamed because of being a minister, didn't think that folks would um, respect me if they knew that I had OCD or sought treatment. And it was really after that relapse that I started speaking out in advocacy because I wanted folks to know they weren't alone. Um, and it's because that was one of the toughest periods for me, but also one that brought the most hope. Um, it was by working with my provider and in navigating exposure and response prevention, also utilizing ACT and moving towards my values that I was able to overcome it, um, that I actually ended up stronger in my recovery than ever before and able to speak about my story and talk about it and, and help others in ways that like I never, ever, ever thought possible. And I want you to know that this theme can feel different, just like any theme can feel different. Whatever you're latched onto is going to seem like the most significant thing in the world. You might find yourself saying things like, if I had any other theme, I could handle it. But this one, no way, right? This one is no different. And here's the thing, you can handle it. And a big turning point for me was starting to say, you know what, I'm willing to risk that I have everything I'm afraid of. I'm willing to risk all of the scary stuff is true in order to move towards all of the things that are meaningful to me, in order to create this big, beautiful life, in order to make a difference in the world. And you deserve that for you. And also the world deserves you. And I want you to hear that. I also think it's not about accepting, accepting uncertainty isn't about saying, oh, the scary thing is true, right? It's about accepting the general uncertainty of life. And it's about saying, maybe, maybe not, not in a 50-50 kind of way, saying like, yeah, I can accept uncertainty while still having radical faith that this is probably my OCD. And I'm just going to stick with all of the ick and I'm going to leave it here as I move towards my life as I listen to wise mind, as I do all of those things. So you are not alone. Um, I hope you I hope you hear that from me and you are so loved. Um, I also hope you check out one of our recent town halls on real event and false memory OCD um, with, with John Hirschfield. Um, and, and we addressed this here as well, which also flows into our next question. What do you do about confessing a real event or false memory? Um, yeah, so... Confession with OCD is a no-no um, because it's a compulsion, right? It's only going to make it stronger. By confessing, you're signaling to your brain that you must have done something wrong. And the OCD is going to continue to spiral and get bigger and bigger and bigger. For anybody who's seen Little Shop of Horrors, um, Ethan and I did a parody from that, actually a musical parody at the in-person conference, but you might know Audrey too. We were talking about this this week, that Audrey too starts off as this little plant and the more that she's fed, she gets bigger and bigger and bigger and starts eating people. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then completely ignore me. Um, I love musical theater. But um, it's it's kind of the same thing. And confessing is a part of that compulsive process. I know with the false memory component, um, I, I've been in the position of worrying, wait, what if I committed that crime that I saw on TV? Or what if I committed a crime and forgot and almost calling the police on myself just to make sure. Um, with real event, I know so many folks think about maybe something that happened even 10, 20 years ago and feel like, well, I need to call up that person that I said that thing that could have been misconstrued as mean to, and I need to like let them know that I'm sorry. I need to confess. I need to confess that this thing was my fault. And here's the thing. I think thinking about the function there, like, why are you, why are you doing it? Are you doing it to alleviate the fear and alleviate the anxiety, right? Because if you're doing that, 
it's, it's compulsive that confessing. I'm going to tell you when it's linked with OCD, most likely compulsive, and it's just going to make that OCD come back stronger. So rather you can sit with it. Um, you can sit with all of the bad thoughts and the feelings and the guilt and the shame. And you can know, um, no matter what OCD says, who you are in this moment and continue to move forward towards all, all of your values while letting all of the noise be there. So where does self-compassion come into the conversation? Um, yeah, so um, this flows through everything and, and we've talked about that um, already a couple times today, um, but you deserve self-compassion. Of course, you deserve compassion for those around, from those around you. And I hope you offer love and compassion to those around you, but I want you to know that you deserve to treat yourself in that same way loving way that you would treat a friend. Um, and I often tell folks, you know, there, there are even exercises that you can do, even looking at an empty chair and thinking about somebody sitting there and going through that same thing you're going through. What would you say to them? And how do you put your hand on your heart and say that to yourself? I think it makes a big difference with, with OCD because ERP is hard, right? And OCD is hard. Fighting OCD is hard. And being able to give yourself a big hug sometimes and say, you know what, <laughs> I am proud of myself for fighting is a big deal. It also can be a big deal when we might engage in a compulsion. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm always really big on telling folks, do your best not to engage in compulsions, right? Because that's, that's what makes us well as we move towards our lives. But if you do, it is not a time to completely demoralize and beat yourself up just like you wouldn't do for a friend. Um, I think we can be compassionate without being satisfied. I can say, okay, I did that compulsion and I'm a little upset about it, but I'm going to give myself lots of love. OCD is really hard. And at the same time, I'm not going to be satisfied. I'm going to move forward in a different day or in a different way tomorrow. And all of those things can fit together. And finally, um, how do you separate faith from OCD during treatment. Um, so of course, I would always encourage you to work with an OCD um, specialist to work with your local provider. Um, but faith in OCD can get really tricky, especially when we're talking about religious scrupulosity, um, where OCD is really latching on to religious practices or religious beliefs or faith traditions, right? And um, I often ask folks when we're talking about, well, is this a question or a practice related to faith? or OCD, what the function is. Are you engaging in this or are you asking this question because it's bringing you closer to the divine or to your beliefs? Is it bringing meaning or hope or comfort? Or are you engaging in this or are you act, asking this because of fear or anxiety or guilt or shame or this sense of urgency? If that's the case, it's probably related to OCD. Um, and I've received the question from folks before, well, like, what if you're praying when a plane goes goes down? Um, that means you're afraid and that's not a compulsive prayer. No, I totally get that. But in that case, you are praying or engaging in your practice in order to find hope and meaning in the midst of a fearful situation. You're not praying because you're afraid of not praying. So I would really encourage you to think about, well, what's the function? Is it around meaning, hope, value, connection? Um, comfort, or is it around this fear, anxiety, um, kind of urgency component? And really thinking about that can help you and your clinician and your work to be together begin to, to separate that out so that you can create exposures and that you can create a hierarchy so that ERP can break down all of the OCD and you can get back to your faith in a way that's meaningful and value-driven for you. So y'all, Thank you so much for, for listening and watching and um, for tuning in for OCD Mailbag. I'll be doing these every month um, along with some of our other advocates as we try to make sure that all of your questions get answered because you are important and your questions are important. Um, and we've been where you are. I've, I've been where you are. And just want to close again by saying that you are absolutely not alone. And regardless of what your OCD might be saying in this moment, there is so much hope and you deserve all the compassion and you deserve and can live a big, beautiful, 
joyful, awesome life. Again, regardless of what OCD tells you, you can do that.